Jerry Robinson. Bigger. I'm sure you know much about him, but I think you're going to learn a few more things today. And basically, we want Jerry to talk about himself. And I have to tell you that Jerry is Jerry's favorite subject. <laughs> so we're going to ask some questions. That I'm going to ask some questions to Jerry. Uh, we're going to put up some time for some questions for you to ask him some questions afterwards. Uh, and there's going to be a slideshow going on over here. And uh, Jen, this is Jen Robinson, his son. And he's going to be trying to sync the um, slides that he has in some manner with whatever we happen to say. So, so I'm going to start out in the most obvious place, Jerry. Um, what does a journalism student from Columbia and how did he end up here in San Diego? I mean, you must have always wanted to be a comic book artist. When I was standing up, I had no... Uh, my yeah, they're closer. Oh, my. They're closer. That's better? No, I had never had a thought of being a, a comic book artist or a comic artist, actually. Um, I guess the story should begin. When I graduated high school, I... Um, I spent the summer selling ice cream on my butt from a bicycle with a cart of the ice cream behind it. And it had motorized ice cream at that time. So I loved it by bicycle. And I was on a 98 pound track, track team, so I was always very, very light. But at the end of the summer, pedaling that bicycle with the ice cream, all summer I was down to about 98 pounds. And my mother persuaded me to take $25 that hard earned money and we all waited to tighten up. She didn't think I'd survive the first semester of college. And uh, so I did, and I went to the mountains, and I, I was on the tennis team, so I couldn't wait to get out to the tennis court. And I threw on the jacket, which I used as a warm-up jacket, which um, was just an ordinary painter's jacket. It was a fan at the time to decorate it with drawings. I think we copied it. Uh, I grew up in Trenton, New Jersey, near Princeton. And so we saw the college kids wearing these jackets decorated, so we took it up. So I had mine decorated with drawings all over, as just a fad. And uh, I was out by the tennis court, and somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, Who did those drawings? It was on the back of the jacket. I thought I was going to be arrested. <laughs> I, I couldn't remember what I had drawn on the back. And uh, he said, no, oh, they're pretty good. And he introduced himself with Bob Kane, who had just started uh, back then. And uh, I think the first issue was out, and he was up there celebrating the first issue. He never played tennis. I don't know how he happened to walk by the court just the moment I arrived with that jacket. That's how I'm here today. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, so he said, uh, uh, I'm the creator of Batman, and, and it just came out in the comic book. I said, what's that? What's the comic book? I had no idea. So he showed it to me. And frankly, I wasn't very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I was just sitting Hal Foster and, and Raymond and Brad Stewart in the newspaper, Milton Kniff, Terry McPyros. And uh, I was due this to go to uh, Syracuse University. I had applied to Syracuse, Columbia, and Penn. Unfortunately, I was accepted in the hall, and I decided to go to Syracuse for no good reason, except I thought it sounded more like a college town rather than in New York or Philadelphia. I had never been to New York before. And they said, well, that's too bad if you went to Columbia. You could, I, I did it. Somebody would join the staff for Batman, which just came out. And, uh, quickly ran to the phone and called Columbia to see whether my application was still good. It was. And I said, I'm coming. And I called, went to call the Syracuse and said, I'm not coming. I called my parents and said, I'm going to New York. I have a job. And I decided to go to Columbia instead. And uh, I didn't know how to get to New York. So I asked somebody at the desk, and uh, they were telling me I had to change a couple of buses and get to New York. And he said, but uh, Mr. Pierce, the famous uh, opera singer at the time, is Jan Pierce, who had just given a concert at this place. And uh, 
or Batman number one. So um, I immediately offered to do one of the stories, which uh, Bob and Phil were very happy about. They really Phil was doing one of the stories. And um, so that led to uh, the Joker, which we can discuss separately. But, um, the fact that, the, that they suddenly needed that many stories made an opening for me to uh, do a story, and I thought that's great. I'll, I'll do a story for that, and we'll get paid, and uh, I'll hand it into my creative writing class at Columbia. <laughs> well, you uh, sort of brought up the subject, so we might as well ask you now about how the Joker was created. Oh, wow. That story actually led to the history of Joker because I went home that night, uh, very elated. I was going to do a story. And of course, Bob and Bill already knew that my, by the way, I started journalism. That's my tradition. And uh, so I wanted to be writing. And uh, they knew that. And they had read some of my stories that they had already written. My creative writing class, and I had written some others. I think when I was about 15, I submitted a story to Saturday and Saturday Evening Post, which was the big weekly magazine. Of, uh, and I got a rejection slip, which I proudly carried around with me. I thought that's an honor to get rejected. <laughs> anyway, so I went back to do that first story. And my whole idea of the genre was I wanted to create a new villain for Batman that was worthy of Batman, that would, that would uh, test Batman's skills. And uh, because I was immersed in literature in all my classes, and I knew that all great characters in uh, heroes and in, in literature and the protagonists. Uh, and so my idea was to, to create a villain that was kind of larger than life. And you have to project yourself back to 1930, or something, 39. That in the is a sport by this time. And uh, this, we were just coming out of the Depression. Uh, the uh, bad men in real life were Dillinger, Pretty Boy Floyd, Art Barney and Clyde, and Machine Gun Kelly. And then there's where, where we patterned our gangsters in. And it was mostly racketeers and investors in the comics. Maybe a mad scientist now. Other than that, we really take off on uh, real life tension. So I wanted to do a period of film that was better than life, it was more uh, literary, more of the Sony. And uh, so my first thought was to create a character, and I knew my studies of good characters have some contradiction in their nature. And so I thought a villain with a sense of humor would be memorable and be interesting. Uh, I had written a lot of my pieces in college sort of stories for kind of satires that you involved. So I guess that's how I leaned for that. Once I crystallized that in my mind, the next best thing to do in Congress is to get a good name that fits the persona of the character. And being things that you don't have a sense of humor, I almost immediately thought of the name of the Joker, the uh, character. I think that came out of the, uh, also it drew upon my past because my family were big card players. I, one of my brothers was a champion bridge player, and, uh, master points in bridge and so forth, and won 17 tournaments in a row. So I guess I immediately, once I thought of the some kind of sense of humor and got the name of Joker, I thought of the playing card, Joker. So I immediately searched my room to find it about two o'clock in the morning to find a deck of cards. And luckily it had that classic image of the Joker. And I knew right away that was it. So I patterned no, that's it. That was my first drawing that night, concept card of the Joker. And so the rest of the night I fleshed them out, conceived the story, and, and so that's how the end. The I think 70 years later is still be talking about the joke. But everybody knew that we had a great character. We just thought there were a few stories. And, uh, that, that's well, you had a little bit to do with uh, Certain Boy Wonder also, did you know? 
you know, um, <coughs> Bill Singer, the writer, had the idea of adding the boy to the ship, which uh, he really wanted, you know, to enlarge the story potential. Uh, we're back man to save uh, Robin and vice versa. He has somebody to talk to. And also, uh, uh, it was great for the uh, demographics of the ship because the older kids would uh, relate to Batman and the younger readers would relate to Robin. And then again, as I said, the names are so important. We spent all afternoon <coughs> kicking around names for the boy. And uh, I think they'll came in with a list of about 30. And uh, we discarded each one one by one and we couldn't resolve it. Uh, I know I personally wanted something, I guess I agreed that that didn't give any hint of anything super about the boy. Batman, uh, we pride ourselves that was not a super, didn't have superpowers. And we were in competition with Superman, the same publisher, and they were very good friends of mine, so it was just, uh, especially when we were competing. And uh, we thought that Superman, uh, because he was vulnerable, uh, I'm sorry, invulnerable, really was a limited character. We thought it would never, it would never last, pretty much we knew. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we thought we had a better concept. And uh, so I wanted to keep that idea of being a human and not without superpowers. And in searching for the name, uh, I thought of uh, Robin Hood, which I was given a book, which I still have today, that's how precious it was. I had two books that were given to me when I was about 10 years old. One of the adventures of Robin Hood, and the other was the complete stories of Edgar Allan Poe, which I think influenced my visual concept of the Joker also. Uh, the drawings of the, uh, an English artist who illustrated that book, and they were beautiful. Um, I'm going to block something with me at the moment. But the Robin Hood, the adventures of Robin Hood, was illustrated by N.C. Wyatt, great illustrator, the grandfather of the 16 generations of painters of his wife. And uh, I remembered vividly his illustrations. I knew every one of my heart. I poured over that book so many times. And so uh, that's how Robin came to my mind. I suggested Robin and everybody loved it. So it became Robin and I quickly sketched his costume which I just recall from memory from N.C. Wyatt's illustration. So I had the basics of Robin Hood costume, and uh, so that's how the name of the costume came about. Well, Jerry, you're uh, known from that period. Uh, everyone knows you worked on comic books, but uh, and comic books were an offshoot to the newspaper strip, which was being reprints of uh, newspaper strips. So what was a cheap and inexpensive uh, format for distribution actually originally premium. Uh, but I don't know if everyone knows that you actually were involved in the comic strip also at one point. Um, and later on, I, uh, well, I left uh, Batman to create some of my own characters where I could write the trouble I wanted. And uh, some period after that, I um, well, during that period, I worked with Mark Mestrin. I don't know how many of his work. But another great artist, and that is fully appreciated today. And we did a number of features together. Two he had, he had started before I joined. We joined forces, uh, Vigilante and Johnny Quick for DC Comics. And we did a live terror and Friday Yank, and oh, a whole hmm. slew of other characters that we did together. We opened the studio together. And, um, in a later period, I decided I, well, they called me for the New York Herald Tribune, which was a big paper at the time, and they had their own syndicate. And they asked me to collaborate with a writer on a, to create a new feature for them. So we came up with the idea of Jet Scott, who was a science adventure, uh, a science sci-fi sci -fi strip. And uh, there's some pictures of some of them. And, uh, in fact, uh, uh, if you go over to the Dark Horse booth here to the legend, you'll find. By the way. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, my good friend Mike Richardson said, Well, maybe you can tell the story of how you're. <coughs> and, uh, 
Scott? Well, Jerry, I went over to visit Jerry at his house in New York City, and Jerry was doing some house cleaning or something. Actually, he was preparing to uh, put some artwork up for sale, and I saw this amazing uh, strip, a Sunday strip, uh, on one of the tables. And it was Jeff Scott, and I had never heard of this before. Uh, I told Jerry, I think it's some of his best work. And so we made a deal and had to see print again. And, did two volumes of the book on his strip called Jeff Scott. It's amazing, sort of a forerunner, sort of a, a scientific X Files type mm -hmm. character. Uh, uh, inexplicable mysteries, and Jeff Scott would, uh, I guess, jet to the location and uh, right. solve the mystery. Anyway, I enjoyed doing it. I was able to uh, collaborate with the story and did all the, all the drawing, penciling, and everything. We had every total, uh, so it's a daily and Sunday. So it was in, a lot of them very intense work. I hope we had a day off in two years to Jet's Cup. So that was that episode. And uh, after that, I really realized what I wanted to be all the time, and that was a critical cartoonist. And I submitted my ideas to a syndicate, and uh, I brought the idea of still life which were inanimate objects coming, commenting on the news. There might be a few of them here. Well, Mark Evanier one time said that uh, he thought there were a variety of Jerry Robinsons. Uh, what was that about? Well, uh, for all the different things I did, from comic books to comic strip, and I illustrated maybe 30 books at one period for the most major publishers, and uh, the political cartoons. I let the material dictate my style. I never thought of creating a style that follows through in all my work. Uh, I found it interesting to create the, uh, the manner in which I interpreted the work and what I wanted to accomplish to dictate the style how I thought would be best told. So I was a book illustrator for many years and uh, an accomplished it. But 32 years, by the way, I did a daily political cartoon uh, six days a week. And so that was, uh, I thought, was exhilarating. And so I left the material and dictate the style. So many people who met me as a political cartoonist and sometimes found out I'd be a Batman, they thought it was some other, somebody else. And, and uh, <coughs> that's, I think, how you know, Mark decided to work. Several Jerry Robinson's was a, a variety of style. And I guess you'll see some of them. So, aside from your cartooning work, I know that you were very early on uh, involved in uh, creative rights, uh, the rights of the creators and artists and writers. Well, I, mean, I guess most notably with my friends, uh, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, we became close personal friends. Uh, uh, they both moved out to California from the University when we were in Colorado. And when I was with more Mexican, we had a studio together with three artists more, Mexican than another. One of my closest friends, very fine, who had a short career in the comics. He was drafted in, in the war and became a combat photographer. And uh, unfortunately, he was killed in the Anzio, one of the battles in Italy. But anyway, uh, our apartment in New York became kind of a hangout for cartoonists and writers. And, and uh, among them was Jerry and Joe. And uh, in fact, uh, Joe and I double dated for a while. Uh, uh, Joe uh, was a Superman and Batman and would be dating and competing with the young ladies. But I must. I guess uh, the Joe, Joe had a, a, a particular uh, um, requirement for, for his young ladies. They had to be at least, uh, probably preferably a top model, and always at least 5, 11, or 12. <laughs> and so uh, when we asked him to get him a date, I didn't have that many of the description. So that was really difficult. So we managed. 
Anyway, with Zeno and Schuster, they used to toast, so I didn't see them as often when I was working late at night, which I did at that time. In fact, I was teaching at the School of Visual Arts for 10 years, and I would teach from 5 to 10 in the evenings, and then I'd go back to my own drawing at night. And I always had the television on, and uh, at the time there was a talk show, the most popular one was Tom Snyder, <coughs> and uh, I heard the name of Jerry Siegel, and I looked up, and there was he on the screen, and for the first time he went public uh, telling the world that of his flight, that they were really he and Spartan and Joe, who were friends from grammar school. We were really destitute. Once they started to sue for their rights on Superman, their name was removed, they had no money. And Jerry was actually working as a mail clerk in California. He had, he had a wife and a child at the time. <clears throat> and uh, Joe was certifiably blind uh, at that time. When I met him, he, his eyes were quite dead. And they were very destitute. Joe was living at the, uh, supported by a brother who was a draftsman and was earning a minimal amount. And uh, it was just tragic. He was the creator of uh, probably the biggest property of the 20th century. He made billions. So the man of all the facets of the movies, the books, the toys, getting reprinted. And uh, so when he went public, most of us in the profession thought that they had signed finally an agreement that took care of them and that they had gotten a pension for the rest of their lives, which proved not to be so. So I quickly called Jerry in California and uh, offered to help in some way. And uh, so we were grateful. And uh, as other artists in the Atlantis, we you know, didn't know them, but also offered to help. So we found joint forces. And so we spent uh, some time on and plotted a campaign. That's how I had a newspaper syndicate and knew all the artists around the world. So I called my friends in London, from the leading paper in Mexico, Canada, and then the leading uh, cartoonists in this country, political cartoonists, and we engineered a whole campaign about five or six of just. They had refused to negotiate for a while, but once we started this campaign, we opened an avenue of discussion with Warner Brothers, who had already bought um, Time Warner, bought Superman, bought DC Comics. So we're now dealing with a new generation uh, of much more enlightenment, hopefully, than the original publishers. And uh, so we finally, after negotiating for an intense period of time every day, um, Jerry and Joe went back to California. They couldn't stand the stress uh, for us to continue the, the settlement. And uh, they would come on this way short of the campaign. Super, that big first big Superman movie was coming out. And so they didn't want any bad publicity about Superman. So that gave us leverage in our, in our negotiation. And finally, uh, we did uh, quite a settlement. And they got a pension for the rest of their lives. So, in recent years, uh, it had been open for, for uh, their, their heirs to resume the the, the, uh, the fight for their rights. So they settled with them, and they, they knew said that they saved their lives at the time. The big, the big, the last big uh, um, thing of contention, which I could tell you about in negotiation, was restoring their name to the property after making the financial deal. And that was one of my pet things that I thought that they had to get their name restored as creators to the Superman. Uh, you know, restore their dignity, their self-worth, uh, it's the right thing to do. And uh, the last day, uh, <coughs> the day before the settlement, Jerry called me from California and he said, you gotta settle. He said, I can't stand the stress. He had already had a heart attack. He said, I, I'm worried that if I don't survive, I won't be able to take care of my wife and child. And he uh, said, settle it tomorrow, but the best terms that you can get. We do what we had already done. 
little change of pace, why don't you tell us about your least favorite assignment? That's the 18 and 19. The longest I have in time is the longest I have in time. I didn't change them. What is that? Your least favorite assignment. Okay. I guess my least uh, least favorite assignment was uh, at one time I agreed to draw Lassie, and um, it was uh, we licensed the Lassie TV show to convert it for television. It was Dell. So uh, you know, at times in your career, you have to draw to make it to pay the rent. And uh, so I thought it might be fun, but God, I got to hate that dog. <laughs> <laughs> it was the dullest thing to do. And, uh, you know, he was always running around, saving people from fires and barns, kids falling in creeks. And, and, uh, and uh, I mean, it was a uh, several to dig up something new for him to do. There was a famous movie, uh, Lassie Come Home, I think it was the first one. Lassie Come Home. The only thing, good thing about that series was Elizabeth Taylor played it uh, in the first one, the first episode. Uh, what I'm writing about in my memoirs, that chapter is called Lassie Go Home. <laughs> <laughs> and my last story, um, I had uh, a series of arsons in, in the countryside. And of course, Lassie is running around, running everybody about the fire. <clears throat> and by the way, I would try to invent ways of drawing him without drawing him. But if he ran through a field, I always had a high grass corn, and he just holds his tail. <laughs> and so last episode, all these fires broke, making out all over, and he's warning everybody. And in the last couple of panels, the arsonist had discovered that it was Lassie. He was setting the fire. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, the editor didn't know. Like <laughs> 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 I, I have an unpublished Lassie story. I'll get the license. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, right now, Jerry, what are you working on right now? Well, I just finished uh, uh, really a uh, Five years uh, of work writing the history of the comics, which you can also find in the comics. Um, um, I think I wrote the original version of it in the early 1970s, which was, I think it was one of the first uh, definitive history of the comics. <coughs> well, that's the cover of the current version. Dark Horse just published. And uh, if you go to Dark Horse, they will buy a copy of this. Well, I might say that uh, if you've seen the earlier version, uh, Jerry has completely got in and remastered the whole book. New art, has some amazing new art. Uh, the, uh, he's updated it, bring it up to present time. He's spent a long time working on this. Really is an amazing work. So. If you're interested in the history of comics, you might stop by that, of course, and just take a look at the It's an amazing book. And there's uh, another project you're working on right now. Uh, my memoir. Which you may find some of these stories that Jerry's talking about. Uh, we didn't even get the final contract to <laughs> uh, But the new edition of the comics, uh, I added 20,000 uh, new words for this new edition. The history up from the 70s to the present. And now, with the Dark Horse, they have such magnificent color reproductions. I'm really proud of you just if just, you just, just look at the book of color. And all the best work of everybody from the other kid that I was reading to Milton Kenneth and all the greats and the current ones too. And Jerry put, put a, color. Jerry put a tremendous burden on me in that book because. He wanted to add some additional Flash Gordon, Alex Raymond art, and some additional Hal Foster, and I had complete runs of the comic strip. So he told me to pick two or three of my favorite pages, which 
took me like weeks because you can sort of narrow it down a little bit if you're a real fan of those two artists. I don't know if you understood Prince Valley and Flash Gordon. Very hard to get down to those few pages. And finally, I gave up and said it went about six weeks and told him to pick. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get into some of the hard work. But he's one of those uh, pieces of color art in the book where a person was selected as the best of that artist's work and represented what they're really known for. So there are about 120 new color illustrations in that edition. But I did additional research of the new edition that I particularly added to uh, some sections on uh, women in comics which are unappreciated. I knew some of the pioneer women in the comics when I did the first edition. There's an Edwina Dumb of the UMM um, who did a wonderful strip called uh, um, Tippy, you know, Tap Stubs and Tippy, about my grandmother and my and my grandson and dog. And it was a wonderful strip for right, many right years. And so I, I expanded on the women in comics, and there were some pioneer women too, about the 20s. And uh, then I also expanded on the on the blacks in comics, which I appreciated. There were some great black artists that were ignored in early editions, and um, a few other uh, areas which I expanded on. Also, the first comic strip of all, which I identified in my first book. Was Yellow Kid, and uh, I did more research on, on Yellow Kid. It was really a pioneer strip. Obviously, it's the first that put all the elements of the comics together and became the uh, well, most popular uh, uh, character in the comics and really transformed the syndication. But I did some additional research. I began to recognize it really was a, a profound strip in its it, it was a, about a, a street urchin in the slums of New York. And he was the first one to really, uh, uh, I compared it to the photographs of a famous photographer uh, at the turn of the century who recorded the slums the photography of Reese. And I think this is really the comic uh, strip version of it. So he was far ahead of his time. It was the very first trip. So I expanded that and there were a lot of beautiful color pages of uh, um, Al Kalt was his name, and also uh, Winsor McKay who did uh, uh, Little Nemo, a gorgeous strip. He also did the first animated film of any of uh, Gertie the Dinosaur. And he drew about 20,000 individual uh, slides to photograph to make that short animated film because they didn't have cells at that time. So every time you do it, something that moves, you know, you've got to do a little new drawing for it. And uh, so he was remarkable. He did that whole thing himself. Anyway, all that's in the book. I think we have just a few minutes for if there's some questions real quick. Right over here. So he said, I'll bring in a picture of the time that we come back. As I said, he would attach 
pictures to the to the scripts and uh, it helped him mentally to flesh out his concept of the Joker as he was writing some of the Joker stories. So the example of the Connery beat came after the first concept. Yeah. Yes, right there? If you don't want to deny the Joker question, why the green hair? He's asking why does the Joker have green hair? I, I guess it was uh, uh, to make him more bizarre, remember? You don't normally see that. <laughs> questions? Any others? One more question? Right there. I was going to ask if there was any specific, you mentioned a lot of things like Milton Caniff um, and a lot of the other artists from that time period. Was there anyone specific that inspired you when you were coming up with all of these different storylines for various comics and yeah. political stuff? The question is, uh, artists such as Milton Caniff, did they have, uh, did they influence Jerry's work? Well, I'm not directly, but I love the Milton's work. Uh, as soon as I came to New York, I was able to see it daily in the, in the daily news when it appeared. So I did follow it, and I guess uh, anything you like influenced you in some way. So I studied it, I saw the storytelling techniques and so forth. And I remember while I was still doing that, and I read an item the paper that he was giving a lecture at the museum. And so I was starting to experiment with some of my own characters. So I had some of my portfolio to take up and show the great man. And uh, I didn't consider myself full professionally at my best in terms of a student who was already doing that. So I waited in the back of the room. He was giving this lecture and everybody crowded around him afterwards. I thought I'll never see him. And he was rushing out uh, for an appointment after the lecture. So I'm standing in the back of the room and he walks by. And this is typical of Milton who I got to know very well as a personal friend later on. Uh, and he was uh, kind of a grand master of the cartoonist. When I was president, when I was president of the Cartoonist Society, he was sitting in all my board meetings. And he was a lovely man. Anyway, walking by, rushing to go out, he saw me standing there with my portfolio. He said, you want to see me? He I guess I was about 19 or And I said, yeah. And so I said, Pop in the car. Yeah, I guess I can look in that So going downtown, we looked at my portfolio. And we remember that years later, we signed one of the drawings. And we remember that is. The one thing I might uh, tell about at this time is about the Catherine Broadway for Plato. My eyes aren't that good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, I'll be going from here to part of Sally. And so if you have folks to sign or something. The question is to ask you to play the other side. Yes, I got about to play the other side. We'll get the rest of the story. <laughs>
It's my honor and privilege to announce the 2011 recipient of the Sparky Award. Mr. Jerry